So let's take a look at some typical fragmentations that you see in mass spectrometry. So let's go back and take a look at the acetophenone molecule, a molecule that we saw in a previous video where we were focusing on the M plus peak at 120 representing the mass of the entire molecule. What I want to look at in this video is what are these other fragments? I've labeled a couple here on the screen at 43, 77, and 105 mass to charge ratio. So what are those fragments? And before I talk about this, let me just mention to you, notice there are many, many peaks in the mass spectrum that I have not labeled. You have a lot of little tiny peaks in the baseline here, and I haven't labeled them, and you know what? I'm not going to worry about what they are. There isn't a mass spectrometrist alive who could tell you what every single one of these fragments is in the mass spec. What I like to do is think about this as a jigsaw puzzle. I want to take the biggest pieces of the puzzle I have, and I want to figure out how to piece them together and connect them in the right way to make the molecule that I'm analyzing. And if I can do that in the smallest number of chunks possible, it means I'm going to get to the answer faster. So you usually want to start with your tallest peaks in the mass spec, and work your way down to next tallest, next tallest, next tallest, and only go as far as you have to until you've constructed the molecule from the jigsaw pieces. So if we look at the fragments on the screen here, it says that the 77 and the 105, those are, are pretty tall. Remember, the height of the fragment in the mass spec, if you look at your y-axis label, is relative abundance. And so this means that, for instance, the 77 fragment and the 105 fragment are incredibly abundant. And why would they be abundant? Because they're incredibly stable. So the fragments that are the most stable, that live long enough to make it to the detector and be recorded, they're going to show up as the most abundant. And you know what rules to invoke when trying to explain the stability of these cation fragments. It's the same rules of electronic stabilization you've talked about in class, resonance delocalization, hyperconjugation, inductive effects, electronegativity effects, those are the electronic effects that you invoke to explain why a fragment is so stable and therefore so abundant in the mass spec. So, for instance, let's take a look at these fragments, 107, 105, and 120, and see if we can identify what they are and why they are abundant or not so abundant. So, we'll um, first take a look at the uh, acetophenone. And remember, as the acetophenone passes through the ionization chamber in the mass spec, it's a random event to try to knock out um, electrons. And so if, for instance, we split the bond right here on acetophenone, using electron impact, let's cleave this bond right here. And we can get two radical cation pairs, right? We can either cleave and get the benzene cation, which I'm showing here, and then you'd have the radical uh, part where you've got the uh, carbonyl, or you could have the plus charge on the carbonyl carbon and then the radical on the benzene. If we have the plus charge on the benzene and add up C6H5, that equals 77 for the mass to charge ratio. So the 77 fragment that we saw in the mass spec is the phenyl cation. And it is, uh, it's an aromatic cation with electrons going around the circle in that ring. It's a stable cation. Um, and that is why it is so abundant. So then, if we take the same acetophenone molecule, and this time, let's split right here. Let's split to, instead of the left of the carbonyl, let's split to the right of the carbonyl. And so if we cleave this bond right here, again, we can either get a methyl cation, and the carbonyl carbon has the radical, or we can get the carbonyl carbon with the cation, and the methyl will have the radical. It's pretty hard to imagine a carbocation that would be less stable than a methyl carbocation. Uh, carbocations are stable when you put um, alkyl groups around them, and the more you substitute around them all the way up to tertiary, the more stable the carbocation. So I don't think I'm going to see the methyl carbocation show up in the mass spec. It's just too unstable. Um, and uh, so you don't, you don't see that one. But if you look at the fragment to the left, if I have the plus charge on the carbonyl carbon as shown on the screen here, then that is going to weigh 105 grams per mole. So here we've got the six carbons, so six times 12, plus the five hydrogens going around the ring, plus 12 for the carbon here, plus 16 for the oxygen here, 
add that all up and you get 105. So this 105 fragment is what we're seeing in the mass spec. So why is the 105 fragment so abundant in the mass spec? Why is it so tall? Well, if you think about the 105 fragment, okay, we'll look at the 105 fragment and we'll see all the possible resonance contributors for that fragment. So here we have, we've cleaved the bond and so we have uh, the plus charge and the carbonyl carbon and then we can start drawing resonance contributors. And so here, if we take electrons and move them over this way, and then uh, leave behind our plus charge here, we have this resonance contributor. And then, of course, we can move these electrons up here, and now we're gonna have the plus charge on this carbon. Okay, and that's what we see over here. And then if we move these electrons, as they naturally will wanna move towards the plus charge, right? Then we'll have this resonance contributor down here where I've got the plus charge over here on this carbon. So there are these four resonance contributors and that means the plus charge is stable. The more you can resonance delocalize the charge, the more stable the intermediate you're looking at. So uh, there with four resonance contributors, that's a way of explaining why this uh, ion is so stable and therefore so abundant. But then there's also another resonance contributor that you can look at that actually involves a ring expansion. So if we go from the 105 fragment here, and let's go down to this fragment we're looking at on the bottom here. And how do we get there? Well, we've got a six-membered ring on the top and a seven-membered ring on the bottom. That's a ring expansion. And so if you expand the ring this way, so this would be a one, two alkyl shift, it will leave behind a plus charge on this carbon, and that's what you see down here. And this is uh, known as a tropone, O-N-E for the ketone, a tropone cation. Again, another way to stabilize this charge, it goes through ring expansion, and that's another explanation as to why this is a stable and abundant fragment in the mass spec. Now, let's look at uh, the example of ethyl octanoate. Now, in ethyl octanoate, the M plus uh, fragment is 172. In other words, knock out a non-bonding electron from anywhere on the molecule, and you generate a, a charged species, which has a mass charge ratio of 172. That's the molecular weight of the entire molecule, ethyl octanoate. But let's see if we can predict what some other abundant fragments would be. And so if I think about ethyl octanoate, um, then what would you expect a stable fragment to be for the mass spec? Well, if we take ethyl octanoate and look at that carbonyl, isn't it true that if I generate a charge on the right-hand side of the carbonyl or the left-hand side by fragmenting with electron impact, I'm going to have a carbonyl carbon with a resonance stabilized carbocation, and that should make it so that we would see it show up in the mass spec. So if we take a look at this and we use an electron and we impact and fragment just to the right of the carbonyl. And remember, we can fragment one of two ways. We can get the plus charge on the 127 ion or the plus charge on the 45 ion. But when the plus charge is on the 127 ion, again, remember, the plus charge there would mean that if I use the uh, lone pairs of electrons on the oxygen, to resonance delocalized down into the plus charge, I have a resonance stabilized um, fragment. And so, in fact, I do see a 127 fragment in the mass spec that results from fragmenting to the right of the carbonyl. Well, if I can fragment to the right of the carbonyl, then I should also be able to fragment to the left of the carbonyl and see a resonance stabilized ion. So here, if I add up what the mass of uh, this ion would be, then it would be 15 plus 14 plus 16 plus 12 plus 16. Add that up on a calculator and you come up with a mass to charge ratio of 73. So fragment just to the left of the carbonyl in ethyl octanoate and we get this highly resonance stabilized fragment with mass to charge of, of 73. And in fact, we do see 73 in the mass spec. The thing that's a little bit uh, pesky about the mass spec of ethyl octanoate is this peak at 88. What is this peak at 88? It's very tall, which means it's very abundant. It's very stable. Well, I'll tell you what. If you get out a calculator and you look at the structure of ethyl octanoate 
and you start um, just randomly fragmenting and um, breaking pieces off to see what happens. You can fragment here and add up what's to the left. It will not weigh 88. Then you could fragment here or you could fragment here or here or here or here. Just basically go down the backbone of the molecule, chop it in half, look at the masses of each half and see if you ever come up with a mass of a fragment that has a mass charge ratio of 88. And you will not be able to do it. I bet you'll be able to come up with a fragment that weighs really, really close to 88, but it will not be exactly 88. And if it's not exactly 88, then you're not looking at the right fragment. So this uh, fragment with mass charge 88 is actually what is known as a McClafferty rearrangement fragment. And we're going to talk about the McClafferty rearrangement and what that is in the next video.